I'm glad we're getting right into it. I'm glad the tissues are up here. Um, <clears throat> and Becky, you were preparing for me before I even knew I needed it, so thank you. And <laughs> um, I thought of something. I didn't think of something. The Holy Spirit really hit my heart with something between sessions. So I'm just going to kind of touch on that real quick, and then we'll dive into the Word. I was thinking about, it was after Debbie spoke, really. I was thinking about how I talked about being exposed. Um, and really, from a, my own personal bias in that, it felt very uncomfortable and ugly. Like, awkward, maybe, if I was exposed. But can I tell you how God will use that being exposed to expose strengths? Because, Debbie, when you share your testimony like that, and you exposed your heart, yourself to us, what I saw was God's strength. And so not, so my personal bias in the first section is like, oh, if I'm exposed, it feels a little, a little awkward. Uh, but it's not just that. When we allow ourselves to be open and take down our guardrails, then other people get to see what God's doing in our life. And that is crucial. I need to see, I need to know when a woman of God has gone through a hard time and come out on the other side of it for the better. I have to know that because I'm going to walk through hard times and I'm not going to know how to handle it. I'm not going to know what to do. And, um, in humility, I know we as sisters are like, I don't want to brag or I don't want to seem like something I'm not. Okay, well, just get out of the way and let God use your openness to show somebody what he is because that is the real issue and we have to see that. I needed to hear Tammy say, I was depleted and I needed to be filled up. And I'm like, oh, that's what I was feeling. I didn't even know what I was feeling, Tammy. I didn't even know. I knew that I moved to another country. It's only been 10 months. It's like the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, and I don't know why. Because I don't think it should be that hard. It's not even Africa. <laughs> okay, that's what's going through my head. It's a city. We have cars and stores and apartments and running water. I mean, the water's sketchy. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't drink the water. Um, but... It's still not Africa. But I needed to hear that from Tammy. And if she had not had the courage to get up when she had so many challenges in front of her face and so many valid reasons, how many of you would have excused Tammy from getting up here and speaking what God wanted her to speak? We would have been going like, girl, I get it. That's fine. I completely understand. Valid reasons why she didn't need to get up here and share that. But in obedience, then God was able to use what she said and, and feed me. I needed that. So thank you. And also just look at exposure from that perspective too, not just your own personal insecurities. So, shocker, we're in Ruth. Chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. We have not gotten very far, and that's okay. We're going to hang out still in verse 8 and 9. <coughs> I'm going to read it again. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I'm going to read it again. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think each time I read it, I just get a little more appreciation for what God is saying. So let me pray and then we'll read. God, thank you so much again for this time in your word. Lord, I just yield myself to you. Just speak through me. Get me out of the way. Give me clarity of thought. Mold us, Lord. Make us exactly who you want us to be in your image, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Ruth 2, 8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Uh, that line is still getting me today, you guys. I haven't read this in a while since studying it, like just to go back and read the scripture again, reviewed my notes. But hearest thou not, my daughter? <laughs> Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. 
Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou, go, when thou art athirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Verse 8, but abide here fast by my maidens. We're going to go back to Psalm 91.1. We were there earlier. We're going to read it again. Psalm 91.1, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So I'm going to give a little testimony. Um, we moved to Alabama. I always say that Alabama was our first mission field because we left all our family here in Kansas City. We sold everything and moved to Alabama. And Alabama is completely different culture. It is, I grew up in Kansas City, so there are words <laughs> that I had to learn. I didn't know when you went to the store, you got your buggy. I didn't know what might not have meant or, you know, fixing. I'd heard fixing in Arkansas a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Fixing wasn't completely new. But uh, to get your buggy or to carry someone to the doctor does not mean you pick them up. <laughs> it just means you take them. So there's all these culture things that are different. I'd never seen a cotton bale. Um, I'd never seen a logging truck. I'd never seen a chicken truck. So you can tell I haven't lived too far outside of Kansas City. But there's just some... Alabama things that were new to me. And culturally, the people are a little different. I love the South. It has great qualities. Hospitality seems to be on the forefront in Alabama. However, um, it's very family-oriented. And if you're not in the family, fellowship is a little challenging. So there's these quirks about this new culture. And um, so we say that Alabama was our first mission field, because looking back now, we see what God was doing. He was training us on how to go to a foreign field, another country, by just moving us that far away from home. Uh, we had been in Alabama for a couple of years. <clears throat> a couple of years, maybe three. I don't remember what led up to all of this. It kind of was a blur as far as um, how I got to this low point. Um, and I'm sure some of you can relate. Like sometimes you get to a low point and you're like, how did I get here? When did that happen? Like how did that abyss just swallow me and I not even see it coming? And I was, I was at work. I have, I, I am a nurse practitioner. I'm careful not to say I was a nurse practitioner because I still am a nurse practitioner, just not working as one. Um, but I had a great career. When we moved there, I prayed because um, I had always commuted to work, right, and had to drive either on the Kansas side or at least half an hour away to go to work. And Decatur is a smaller town. And so I just prayed, God, I, wanna, I don't want to drive to Huntsville. I want a job in Decatur. I don't want to commute to work. I just want to take care of the people in my town and just be an extension of the church. Like, I just want that. And, and, and Lord, please give me a good doctor to work under because I've never worked under a bad one. Like, I literally have not. God is so good. They're all needy, but not bad. <laughs> Male, female alike, they all are needy. Anyway, um, so God answered that. He gave me a job in a nursing home with a rehab attached to it. So like 35 rehab beds where people would like have hip surgery, stay three weeks and then go home or something like that. And then I had 135 long-term care lovelies. And I was their doctor, basically. I, they didn't leave the nursing home for their medical care unless they had to go to the hospital or a specialist. And so... I loved it. I loved the model of care. I loved that it was my little community. Uh, oftentimes, there would be elders or deacons from the church that would come into rehab. Some would get well and get to go home, and some I would hold their hand into eternity. Cecil Sparkman was my first church member that I walked into glory with. You know, it's like 
God, you are so good. This is so awesome. I loved it. Um, and one day I was taking my lunch, and I was in my car, and I was going to go get some lunch, and I'm driving by, and I'm looking at Becky, because I I'm, feel like she can picture where I'm at in the city. and where. So I'm driving um, down 6th, like toward the bridge. Like I was going to go to Hart, there's a Hardee's right there, and a, you know, Catherine, like there's a Jack's. You can get something. And I'm on 6th Avenue, and a lie in my head, you could drive off this bridge, nobody would care. Clear as day, you guys, I have not. Never in my life have I heard a lie like that spoken so clearly. But I, I thought, I could believe this. I could believe this, like, it does not matter. I mean, and I felt like I was five seconds away from a horrible decision. Except that somewhere in the not so distant time past, someone had preached on lies that we hear. Lies that, that oh, I know, Lee was teaching on prayer and listening to God and how you filter what you're hearing through the word of God. That's what it was. And he had said, like, you have to filter what you're hearing. Is it the spirit of God? Is it another spirit? You have to filter it. And, and, I, and I said out loud in my car, that's a lie. But it was like I was convincing myself. <laughs> that's a lie. I know that's not true. How did I get here? How did I get here that I would even be so vulnerable as to hear that lie? and have to address it, have to face it. And so I pulled over, called my husband. I'm like, I just heard this lie, and it was in my face, and I had to tell myself, that's a lie. It does matter. It's not okay to just drive this car off this bridge. That's insane. So I took some time to pray, it took weeks of just studying the word and talking to God and honestly being kind of accountable to my husband on what I was feeling. Just dry. I didn't know how else to describe it. Depleted was a good word. I didn't have that word then. <laughs> it was just dry. And so I'm going through the word and I'm praying and I'm God's saying, Psalm 91, okay? I'd never paid attention to Psalm 91 before. I'm sure it's been preached to me or I've heard it, or, but I can't tell you that I'd ever like, paid attention to it. So I read it. I sit down with my Bible, good cup of coffee. I'm going to study the Bible. I read Psalm 91. I got nothing, God. He says, read it again. So I read Psalm 91. I got nothing, God. <laughs> and I don't know, I wasn't getting what he was saying to me. So I had to go to Pennsylvania for work training. And I thought, okay, this is some time alone, away, I'll have at the hotel, like in the mornings and the evenings. This will be good. You know, I can, ha I can be not distracted and <clears throat> have this time. So I sit down in the coffee shop and I, I'm like, I'm going to write out Psalm 91. Because sometimes, I'm a tactile learner. Sometimes if my hands are doing it, I'm going to get it better than just reading it or listening to it. Okay? So a hint, if you're having trouble studying something, write it out. Sometimes that helps. I got through the first verse writing it out. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I finished writing it, and I was like, why did you have me read the whole thing? It was right here in verse 1. You could have just told me that. <laughs> but this is where he wanted my focus. Uh, that's interesting. Um, there's two different words there, dwell and abide. Um, and God was wanting me to 
to differentiate between the difference dwell and abide. And he took me through this process of learning how to abide in him. I went through a book study called Rooted by Banning Liebscher, and it, it's a great study. Um, I, I wouldn't dive into doctrine. I would just say that in itself is a good study, okay? It is a good scriptural study of how to be rooted. Um, and it talks a lot about how to abide in the word of God. So, you girls are doing so awesome with my slides. I have no idea where I am. Am I here? It's a pretty picture. I don't know why it's there. Okay. <laughs> Dwell. So there are... Um, Paloma had to... Is Paloma still in? She had to go. It's okay. Okay. Oh, you'll share this point with her. She'll get it. And some others might too. So in the... In the reign of Valera in the Latino Bible, this is much clearer and easy to explain than English, which is funny, because the Latino Bible makes this differentiation, I don't know, easier. Dwell means, to, it's, a, it's like a habita word, H-A-B-I-T, habitation, right? You're like, oh, okay. And abide is a much more specific Latino word. So it's almost easier to understand in Spanish. Um, but... The Hebrew word, uh, yashab, for dwell, it means to sit. It's kind of based on location, okay? Like I have a dwelling place, I have a house, I have a, I'm going to dwell here, I'm going to stay here. It's based on location. Then abide, that word is lunlin. It's relational, it's to rest, it implies intimacy. So I'm gonna back up real quick. Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I had the dwell, I have a relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ, that's the dwell, okay? That's your starting point. But I have to, and you can't have the second part of that verse without the first part, okay? Without the dwell, there is no abide. But if you just have the first part, the dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, that's relational, that shadow of the Almighty. Those words, can you feel those words? I'm like a feely person, like I can feel those words. Shall abide under the the shadow of the Almighty. So Boaz was telling Ruth to abide here. And this abiding is crucial in your walk with the Lord. It is your intimacy with him. It is how you do not get to the bridge thinking, I could drive this car off here and nobody will care. That's what I was lacking, was abiding with him. And you're like, well, you've been in church for a long time. I mean, your husband was a pastor for, yeah, but we're all at risk of getting to that point. Every single one of us could get there in no time flat. Because if we aren't relational with God, if we aren't intimate with him, then we can be vulnerable to hear those lies and God forbid believe them, okay? So let's look at Ruth chapter 3. Look, we made it to chapter 3. Ruth chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. So the word abide is not in these next two verses, okay? But work with me. This is what it looks like, okay? This is Boaz talking to Ruth. And I feel like this is God talking to Heather. Insert your name here. Tarry this night. And it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee. As the Lord liveth, 
lie down until the morning. And she lay at his feet until the morning. And she rose up before one could know another. And he said, let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. Also, he said, do I want 14? Nope, I want, or 15, no, just 14, 13 and 14. Back up to 13. As the Lord liveth, lie down till morning, and she lay at his feet until morning. That's what abiding with the Lord looks like. It's that laying at his feet. Literally, Heather, that's a little ridiculous. No, not. I mean, maybe, maybe for you it is literal. Maybe you've got to get your face on the floor to let go of all of the stuff that's in the way. And if that's what you have to do, then do it. Um, I need to be alone. And it's funny, funny, ha, ha, not funny, but when you go to the mission field, you don't get to be alone anymore. <laughs> oh my goodness, nobody told me that. You're with your husband 24 seven a lot. <laughs> I love my husband, but every day I was working. Like I had a job. I would go to work. He would not be there. I, you know, or I would go have lunch with the ladies and he would not be there. And now we go everywhere together. I'm growing. It's good. Um, but I, for me, that abiding sometimes is just being alone because I won't, I won't let my guard down usually until I'm alone and quiet for a little bit. It, it takes me time to get there. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a process and you have to figure out what works for you, but you have to do it. That's the thing. Okay, guys, like, please, if you walk away with anything, walk away with understanding it. It's, this is not optional. I mean, it is optional, but that's a terrible option, so don't do it, <laughs> okay? You have to find this spot with the Lord because there's nothing better. Nothing else will pull you through life's tragedies than this relationship with your Father. And there's going to be tragedies, like, it's going to come. Okay. So as the Lord liveth, lie down till morning, and she lay at his feet until morning. Let's look at Luke chapter 10. We're going to parallel. We talked a little bit about this this morning. Luke chapter 10, 38 through 42. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost not thou care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered her and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. There is one thing that is needful in this life, and that is the Word. Okay, John 1 tells us that Jesus is the Word. She had to be at his feet receiving his words. We have to be at his feet receiving his Word. Um... Luke, okay, Luke chapter 24. So I'll just set the scene a little bit. We're going to start reading at 25. But just to set the scene, like the disciples have found the tomb empty, um, and Jesus has not ascended. He's walking around. And two men walking down the road encounter him, but they don't know who he is. They don't know him. 
So let's start reading in verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did, our, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? There is only one way that these men figured out who they were spending time with. He, he came in and he abode with them. He spent time with them. And then they realized who he was. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us? I pray that at some point this weekend you felt that. That you felt his word just burning in your heart because you knew that you got to spend time with him. But it doesn't take a women's conference for that. This is a power-up session. I get that and I love it. I love it. But it doesn't take this. It can be that, that alone time um, at home. It can be that discipleship relationship with your sister. Um, so when was the last time you experienced this from time in God's word, that intimacy with Jesus, and only hang out there this long, enough to go, not anymore. Okay, don't, don't hang out there forever. But just realize, is, is there something lacking? Am I dry? Oh, I gotta get, I gotta get my time with the Lord. I gotta get my time in his word. I need to abide with him. The only one who can satisfy the human heart is the one who created it. I don't know who said that, but I think it's great. It is so true. There are a lot of things that my husband is amazing at, but nothing will satisfy you like Jesus. Nothing. If you're single, you're not going to find it in a man. If you're married, you're not going to find it in a man. If you're widowed, you know, it, it's still that, that longing. It's still something only God can satisfy. John 15, 5 through 11. We talked about John 15 earlier. This is just a little, little chunk of it. Oh, that's another Alabama word. They say chunk. I'm going to chunk it. Like, they're going to throw it away. Just came to my mind when I said chunk. <laughs> I'm like, you're going to what? John 15, 5 through 11, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Oof, I have been withered. I have had a season of withered. I was away from the vine. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. I feel like that's where I was at on the edge of the bridge, like hearing this lie. And I'm at risk of just being chunked. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. We can trust him with the deep things of our heart because they are also the deep things of his heart for us. Let 
Getting to the place where our trust can grow is automatically uncomfortable, vulnerable. Banning Liebscher in in Rooted, this is the, the book study that I talked about, says that is why God leads us into places of vulnerability where the deep things in our hearts are exposed and where he gets to reveal himself as our protector and the one who fulfills our deepest desires. He is committed to showing us through his process in our lives that we can trust him and the deep things of our heart because they are also the deep things of his heart for us. Trust is both a verb and a noun. It's one of those, one of those words. We need to see it not just uh, as something we do, but a fruit of abiding in him. I got ahead of myself on the slides. Okay. Um, trust, verb and a noun, something we do, but a fruit of abiding in him. It is the result of our waiting on him, spending time with him. We can build trust based on what we've heard, like putting our trust in him, but true intimacy and dependence comes from building trust on like personal knowledge of time spent with him. There's, it's just that application It's the difference between knowing that you can trust God and having gone through something where you actually had to trust God. Um, The thing that God wants for us most, intimacy, is the target of the enemy. The enemy uses the same strategy he did in the garden. Okay? Uh, Yea, hath God said... Um, can you really trust God to deal with that? I mean, everybody else has failed you. I mean, really? Can you really trust him? Or the allure of trusting something besides God. Even Jesus, when he was tempted, was doing spiritual battle and fought the same way we should. It is written. Ephesians tells us to put on the whole armor of God. No soldier goes to battle without a weapon. Denying time in the word is embracing failure. It's a spiritual batter, battle. It's, it's spiritual suicide. It's driving off the bridge spiritually, okay? Choosing not to be in the word is intentionally laying down the one weapon you've been given. And we would never in a real battle do that. We think that's ridiculous. What soldier is going to go into the field with nothing? So there's promises of being in the word. And I'm freaking out a little bit because my notes disappeared. Okay, it's all good. It's all good. Psalm 119. <laughs> Synonyms for the word. Law. Statutes, commandments, way, testimonies, precepts. So you go through Psalm 119, and there's only like how many verses that don't have one of these words in it, okay? So these are all synonyms for the word. That's tiny. Verse 28. Let's turn to Psalm 119, because we're going we're gonna to go through these. So we'll start, Psalm 119, 28. My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according to thy word. My soul melteth for heaviness. When I wrote these lessons, I wrote down specific instances where I knew that someone's soul melted for heaviness. In this church body, pains that people went through, and I wrote them down, I wrote down their names. I know 
Courtney, you shared this morning, and you were one of the names last year that I wrote down. Because I knew your soul melted for heaviness. I know that Cheryl and Pastor Brownie, have, their soul has melted for heaviness. When Pam lost her family, I know. I felt that. My mom committed suicide when I was 16 years old. I was young. I didn't understand what I was feeling. But I knew hurt. And looking back, I can see my soul melted for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according to thy word. There is no other place to receive strength for your battle but from the word of God. Verse 38, it establishes us. Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. Establish thy word. Establish, it's, we use the word establish. So it's that set, grounded, a foundation. Verse 42, it speaks to us. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. Reproacheth is an old word, right? But it's like that person who comes at you. Maybe it's about a Bible thing. Maybe it's not. Maybe they're just ugly. And they just get at you. And it bothers you. So shall I have to answer him that reproacheth me with your word. Is it written? Yea, is it written? Is it written? It's your one course of action is the word of God. So it speaks to us. It secures us. Verse 117. Hold thou me up, and I shall be safe, and I will have respect unto thy statutes continually. Hold thou me up, and I shall be safe, and I will have respect unto thy statutes, thy word, continually. Verse 160, it sustains us. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. It sustains us. It's, it's constant, never failing. There is not a time in your life when his word has failed you. Not once. And you may have felt failed on. That's not even proper English. But it was not his word that did that. He is not like our human relationships. All right. One thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part. Boaz told Ruth, lay here till morning. Yeah, we're like moms and wives and probably you're not going to get six, eight hours to just lay at the feet of Jesus in the word. I mean, if you get that, wow. Cool. I would probably fall asleep if I got to be still that long. But my point is you need that time at the feet of Jesus. First of all, you have to humble yourself to get there. And that's, that is a, that's a deal. Like, I have to do that. I have to be like, hold on, I gotta take down all my guards and attitudes and get here. Okay, I'm here. 
Just be at his feet in the word and abide there. One thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part. Ladies, we just have to spend time in his word. Challenge one another. Encourage one another. Um, <laughs> Bethany is a pro at this and she doesn't even know it. But she'll be like, Mom, today I was reading and I was like, oh, I forgot to, I didn't read yet today. I need to read. I'm glad she read. And she'll share with me what she read. But praise God, am I, that, that's a, I, I need that. Younger ladies, challenge your, your older ladies, your mentors, your <laughs> whatever I am, I'm getting there. Challenge us, please. Ask us about the word. Tell us what you read. Let us know that God is still working in your life because we need to see that. And then just sharpen one another. Um, sometimes within families, it's even harder. It's easier outside of the family, maybe, to talk to someone about what God's dealing with you. In. But nothing will grow your relationship inside your family sweeter than time talking about God's word. Nothing will. I'm going to pray. I know um, Stebby has a song to play. Uh, maybe this is a jumping off point for just abiding with the Lord. Maybe you've been feeling dry. Just take this time and talk to your father. Right? The Bible says the lover of our soul. I love my husband. There is not everything he can satisfy. Only God can. He's the lover of my soul. There are things in my life that I need, that I crave, that I long for, that nobody else can fulfill. Only him. And we all have those things. We all have those unfulfilled things that we need from God. And he's just waiting to give them. He's just waiting to satisfy them. But I don't remember who said it, but he's a gentleman. Right? He's not going to force it on you. He's a gentleman. He's going to wait for you to come and lay at his feet. Terry here. Terry here. Don't glean elsewhere. He looks right here. Right here at my feet. I want to spend time with you. So let's stand to our feet and we pray together. I'm just going to let the music play for a little bit and give you guys some time.